Are you seeing anything? Now we see your screen that has slow hey. processing speed in the two. Can you go to the poppy slide? Let's see if we see it. Yay. Yeah, okay. just do it's that. Working. Just go just through that. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. These are my gorgeous slides. I'm going to start at the beginning just to show you how gorgeous these are yeah. <laughs> as a reward for that kind of chaos. Um, I was explaining that, you know, we all have a, a different, um, different brain brains and we're just experiencing life differently and that we don't need to grow in the same height with the same level of straightness, so to say. So it's my analogy of how we're all these different kinds of poppies. I was talking with you about what processing speed is. It's a cognitive ability. And these um, processing speed skills allow us to do things at a certain rate. Some of us do things more slowly, others do things with a longer period of time. And what I really wanted to emphasize is that slow processing speed isn't related to intelligence. And you may know of others who are just so impressive, but they don't do things quickly and that's okay. So then I was talking with you um, I, about this kind of simulation where I'm showing you a picture of the night sky and you can see stars. Now, some of you may have already identified a constellation. Has anyone in this group already identified a constellation? No, it's not coming to you yet. So when we talk about processing speed, we are aware that some of us th see things, we perceive things more quickly than others. And I thought some of you might have already automatically known what some of these planets are and what the stars were and what some of the star constellations were, or whether you could see part of the Big Dipper. So some of us can see these things quickly. I just wanted to give us a chance to understand that sometimes when we see things, it takes us time to make sense of what we see. And that also is part of processing speed. So for those of us who have, our quick, who have quick processing speed, we experience a great deal of ease. Things feel automatic to us. We can do things quickly without thinking about them. For those of us who have a slower processing speed, things feel like they take a greater amount of time, more effort, and because we've had experience doing the behaviors before, and I'll get more specific about what those behaviors might be, but because we anticipate that things are going to take us longer than others, and we might compare ourselves to others, and we might think that things will be effortful for us to do them, a whole bunch of other kinds of thinking show up regarding the expectation for that kind of task. So many of you here are parents and you know what processing speed demands of students at school. So you know that there are issues relating to writing in particular. I would say that's probably um, a very common kind of beha learning behavior that parents are concerned about when we talk about processing speed skills. And so here I've got a picture of both someone holding a pencil, so a paper and pencil task, and also typing on a keyboard, which what, with what looks like a one finger approach to the keyboard. So I purposefully chose both of these images because we're going to be talking about different kinds of motor responses. And then also because your parents, you know that slower processing speed skills impact daily routines at home. So I have a picture of the morning routine, which of course is impacted by a slower processing speed, as well as remembering how many things to do at night. But we could also talk about meal times. I know that some of the kids' processing speeds are an issue at meal times as well. So my jumping off point, um, given that kind of um, introduction is by pulling up a sample of a profile. And these are WISC scores. And the WISC, if you're not familiar with this, it's a um, cognitive measure that is given in a battery of tests or assessments that might be included in a psychoeducational evaluation or a neuropsychological evaluation. So many of you may have had your children uh, assessed previously, and you may have scores that look somewhat like this. So I just want to quickly go through and spend time talking about processing speed. So in terms of this um, WISC profile, you may notice that I only have subtest scores. That's purposeful. I really use the subtest scores more than any other scores because the other scores are averages for that index or average for the section. And I'm looking at the score that's most closely tied to the subtest so I can see what we're actually measuring. So knowing what these subtests ask students to do is really helpful because then we know what the, the scores will, will mean. So the first index, you may notice that there are a lot of scores in the teens. So the scores range from 14, 15, 15, and 17. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I'll say that these subtest scores are all in the superior range. So we can say that verbal ability for the student is quite superior. So that means that verbal skills come very easily to this child. In the next section, there's visual spatial ability, and you'll notice two very solid scores, 14 and 14. So this means that the student's ability to visually look at the changes in nonverbal designs and being able to pick from an array of what might come next is as strong as the verbal section, but it doesn't have the same high scores like 15s and 17s. So it may be a comparatively weaker section. Then you look at fluent reasoning. Again, I'm just going to go over this really quickly. So that's a combination of, of language ability as well as visual spatial ability. And you see that this student is able to get back um, the higher scores, 15 and 16, get back out in that higher superior range because the student probably can talk his or her way through the tasks that are being presented um, while they're looking. Working memory, just average. The 12s are on the cusp of the average range. It's high average, but not quite in the superior range. So you may be getting a sense of this child's profile. And now we're going to look at processing speed, and you'll see these two numbers, one and a five. Maybe numbers like this are familiar to you. So this might look like this student doesn't really have processing speed skills. So let's just talk about what these two subtests um, ask. So these are two, coding and symbol search, are what give um, assessors an idea of a student's processing speed ability. So these are both timed tests, they're both paper and pencil tests, and they ask students to do some visual scanning where they have to look quickly at small figures and then cross them out or not cross them out. So they're given a certain menu and the kids have to cross them off. And um, it's really tied to kids moving quickly. So they're looking at a motor response to what's seen, which is visual spatial. So what's what kinds of tasks are like that in school? You know, none, except for maybe Mad Minute, which is like a, a quick math facts fluency type test. So most learning isn't like this, but it gives us a very nice sense of a student's processing speed where we can kind of separate it out from verbal, visual, spatial, fluid reasoning and working memory. Now, some students might have low scores in more than just one index, but I was proving a point in this presentation by really kind of making this child's sample profile very clean so we can just talk about processing speed. But in real life, processing speed is related to so many other things, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's extrapolate what this might mean for a student. So this might mean for a student that worksheets at school are going to be a problem. And for two wee students who have superior verbal comprehension ability, they have so many ideas in their minds. And when they get a worksheet or they get a project, they really have to decipher which of those ideas they want to um, identify in their, on their worksheet. So that means they kind of have to sift through all the ideas that they're thinking of. And that process of sifting takes time, and many children enjoy thinking about their thinking because they've got superior fluid reasoning ability. But in the meantime, the rest of the class is just simply filling out the worksheet or simply following the steps of the project. And a student with this kind of a profile might really struggle. And then when the time is up and the classroom is ready to move on to another activity or the teacher's collecting the pages, or they could be online pages as well. But when the time period is over for that assignment, this student then has to beat the clock and just finish it up. So what do we typically see? We typically see the minimum of a written answer or a blank space, or we see um, writing that isn't very legible, or we hear from the student a lot of reasons why the task isn't important, or why it's boring, or um, why they don't want to do it. So it becomes more of an emotional and kind of behavioral issue than just the straight processing speed. But I wanted to just show you what this looks like because when I see low scores like this, I think when I speak with parents, I think that their child has really spent a lot of time building up the confidence to handle written ex uh, expression and yet also having to really handle their feelings about written expression given the timeline that they're asked to complete things. So guess what? My understanding is that most students think of themselves as a learner not based on their cognitive scores that are superior in verbal ability, not on their uh, visual spatial abilities, not on fluid reasoning, 
certainly not on working memory, but on processing speed. So unfortunately, some children think of themselves as learners based on how quickly and how, and how well they write the responses to the things that they're learning in school, whether it's a worksheet or an essay, etc. So we'll be talking more about um, writing tasks, but I just, wanted to, I just wanted to kind of bring up the idea that we really need to look at where students are connected to their strengths and where they are interested in showing what they've learned or what they know and not make all of learning about the product. That we really need to assist students who have superior skills to know how to handle um, a, an assignment where the processing speed skills might be an issue. And I think that's why most of you were curious enough to show up for tonight. So um, I'm going to be leaving the sample profile, but the takeaway from this slide is that I think that many kids think of themselves as learners based on their processing speed ability, which couldn't be farther from the truth. And I'd like for all of the parents and educators who are here tonight to really think about students and their profiles and really focus on what it is that they love to do, their gifts, strengths, and talents, and emphasize that and different ways to show what was learned as opposed to only uh, expecting written responses, certainly not necessarily worksheets that have small spaces to write answers to, but having a better understanding about the process and how this process relates to a child's self-confidence. And uh, we may talk more about this in some future slides, but I'm ready to leave this slide now, having talked about it. So, you know, here we have, you know, processing speed skills impacting everything. So daily routines, both at home and at school, academic tasks, we talked about written expression, while well, all content areas expect written expression as a product, social interactions, we haven't really talked about that yet, and then emotional regulation, which I kind of alluded to, because a lot of students who don't have strong processing speed skills can feel frustration, can feel anxiety, can feel anger, can feel less than good enough, can feel perfectionism, so there are a lot of emotional things, and most of us then handle the emotional issues without recognizing what it is that is the processing speed in that picture. It's really hard to kind of just look at processing speed. That's why there aren't a lot of studies on it. It's really hard to just, like the closest we could get were the, the subtest scores where we can ask students to hold a pencil and be timed with paper. But, you know, real life, you're living it already. You know, you know slow processing speed. And also, you know quick processing speed. And... I, I'm here to say that sometimes having a quick processing speed isn't good for some students. Yet, let's go back to this profile for a moment and just talk about for a student who might have superior processing skills, but then weaker skills in other cognitive areas, then they may work too quickly for their own good. And then we're looking at maybe issues relating to attention, which have to do with impulsivity. So we really have to be mindful of what does the task require? What kinds of processing skills are needed for the child and how can we assist in the process of learning so that learning remains joyful rather than frustrating or joyful rather than um, anxiety producing and then joyful instead of frustration with the adults who are around. So when I was saying that we don't often see processing skills you know, on their own, we often see them related to other cognitive abilities. So that could be uh, a student who's on the autism spectrum. It could be a student with ADHD. I think that there are many questions parent have, parents have about, well, is it ADHD or is it slow processing speed? Is it slow processing speed or is it active working memory? So the, the next few slides we're gonna be talking about how to determine what that is. I'd like to leave you with that information. Um, slow processing speed can be related to a specific learning disability. So um, in terms of dyslexia, you may have heard the, the term fluency. Well, fluency is processing speed. And related to reading, it's how smoothly a child can read the words on the page. So there, fluency has a very specific meaning related to reading skills. But in life, we all have fluency. Remember when you first began to drive a car, you probably weren't quite that adept at driving the car and rolling down the window. Now, I'm old enough to say that when I learned how to drive, the windows were cranks. None of the windows were automatic quite yet. So that was a really big deal. Um, and then cooking, you know, when we made our first batch of baked goods, maybe brownies, you know, we really had to look at the recipe. We weren't fluent at all. 
but after we've made brownies enough times, we barely have to look at what ingredients to pull out of uh, the pantry. So processing speed skills are related to other kinds of motoric uh, responses and um, they're related to um, specific learning disabilities. I mentioned dyslexia, but it could be dysgraphia, it could be um, dyscalculia, it could be auditory processing, it could be visual processing. So there really is um, quite a bit of comorbidity or co-occurring difficulties that students are dealing with and processing speed may not be the priority, but it's in the mix. And I already mentioned that students who are diagnosed with anxiety may have difficulty starting tasks. And so again, it looks like so processing speed. And so that's definitely part of the mix. So, you know, I know it's on everyone's minds. This is the big question everyone always wants the answer to, which is, can processing speed skills improve over time? And I just love this image because part of it is really in focus and another part is very out of focus. And it kind of shows how much support this race car driver has to do this race. And so I want you to think if your parents or educators, you know, we are supporting the race car. And some race cars have an engine that can enable the race car to propel itself across the finish line, whereas other cars may not have the same kind of engine. Remember I talked about the poppies. We're all growing at different rates and in different forms. And we all have these brain differences. It doesn't mean we're not smart. We will get to the finish line, but not in this kind of a speedy way. So I don't often see that processing speed skills improve over time when I'm working with clients. But when I work on processing speed along with other academic skills, I do see them improve through practice. So I'm going to give you some tools tonight so that you have uh, an awareness about that. And these are the tools. So when we talk about processing speed skills, I'm always asking educators and parents, well, on what tasks are you talking about? Where are you concerned about processing speed skills? And so I'll often ask um, parents and educators to talk about what is their child being asked to perceive? So are they looking at a screen like you are now where there are letters, which is verbal input, or where there are pictures, and that's nonverbal input? So first of all, knowing what is it that the child is, is seeing? Is it visual verbal? Is it visual nonverbal? And then I don't have it listed here, but um, what is the student hearing? Um, is the student hearing auditory verbal or auditory nonverbal information? So auditory verbal might be the words or sounds, and then nonverbal might be tone of voice or a passing um, fire engine siren. And so um, the other kind of input that I can talk about is just sensory input. How do you feel um, you know, with your senses? And the best example I can think of that I use in lectures is on Halloween, sometimes there's a fun game that the kids play, and that is that they stick their hands into a paper bag and they feel what's inside without looking. And based on the feel, what is it? So is it, you know, if it's brains, is it spaghetti? <laughs> you know, um, if it's eyeballs, is it a peeled grape kind of thing? So that's kind of a sensory input. So even though you don't see these different types of inputs, there are visual inputs, there are auditory inputs, and there are sensory inputs that are more tactile. So the next question I ask parents and educators is, okay, what's the output? What is the child being expected to do? And you'll notice that each of these outputs has the word motor there. So there's oral motor, which is speaking. That's an oral response where the mouth moves in a way that we can create sounds. And then fine motor, which is using our fingers. That could be holding a pencil or a paintbrush or a toothbrush or typing on a keypad. Graphomotor is specifically related to letter formation. Grapho is letter, motor is motor, as you know. So graphomotor is really about you know, planning where does a pencil go on the page, what needs to be written with any clarity and legibility, does the student start at the top of the page or the bottom, and of course that includes issues relating to pencil grip, etc. And then gross motor has to do with moving the entire body. So that could be movement that includes, you know, getting up from one seat and putting something in the trash bin, or it could be um, walking up the stairs, you know, it could be OT, occupational therapy related. So when we're looking at processing speed skills, we have to ask, what is the most important aspect of this task? Is the most important aspect to read? Is it to listen? 
um, based on reading or listening, what does the student need to do to show what was learned? Is it something that's going to be written or spoken or acted out or built or painted? So this is really important to look at in what way are processing skills impacting the task? Now, in some cases, doing something quickly doesn't matter, but we don't have forever. And I think that's where parents get the most frustrated, especially with transitions in and out of the car for daily routines like going to school. And it's also frustrating for teachers because teachers believe that once they've given the instruction that the students should internalize the instruction. But students with, with weak or slow processing speed skills are always proving that they're weak or slow. So every time a student is being asked to write, that's an issue for them. That's what they're proving. Now, what does oral motor um, as a response seem like for with relation to processing speed skills? That's noticeable when a student is asked a question in class and they need time to formulate their oral response. So we're not just talking about only writing activities, we're also talking about oral activities. So for a student who um, often knows the answer but can't get it out, the words are like on the tip of their tongue, it's helpful, of course, to ask the questions in advance, have the student prepare, possibly rehearse if that's allowed, and then be able to answer the question without it being a surprise and allowing a student to restate what they want to say, taking the second thing that the child has said or the third thing, not necessarily the first and moving on to the next student. So for processing speed in terms of written expression, there are a lot of accommodations that many of you are familiar with, but they probably aren't enough to kind of alleviate the issues. So maybe we can do some brainstorming tonight. You may be putting items in the chat, but because of the way my computer is configured, I can't see it. So I'll look at that when I get the chance, but I'm with the Our way we tracker. started tonight. Yeah, Elle and I are tracking the chat. So Okay, good. Yeah, because the way we started, I'm really leery to do anything, you know, that won't be able to get me back to the start. We can um, read you the answers in the chat too. Okay, good. So I just want to say as we leave the slide that when we talk about processing speed, we can't isolate it. We have to look at it in terms of what the student is perceiving and considering whether it's visual or auditory or, or tactile and looking at what it is that the student's being asked to do, whether it's oral motor, fine motor, graphomotor, or gross motor, so that we can determine what's the most salient aspect of that task. Is the most salient aspect of that task to know something or to write it? You know, and so we kind of enter the conversation in terms of what's a crutch, but that's premature, but we will talk about that. So, um, you know, parents will ask me during homework time, you know, you know, how do we keep homework from taking three hours? And so I go through this process. Well, what's the input? What's the output? What are the expectations? Are the expectations relevant for the child's um, age and grade level? And then what are the issues? Because then we can decide the best way to support the child, especially, and I'm coming back to this slide, especially the child who has these superior cognitive abilities where written expression may not be the best way for them to show what they know. So I'm going to move on now that I've given you these tools to really analyze. This is called task analysis. Educational therapists use this to look at what accommodations or what modifications or what differentiation we need to provide by looking at what's intact and then supporting or scaffolding instruction for what students have or need support with. So task analysis is great for you at home with these daily routines, as well as for help during homework. What's okay to help your child do? So we may come back to that. And I'm ready to talk about it now. I loved this picture too, because I was talking about the type of engine in a car. And then here's this great picture of all the different uh, cars lined up as if they're going to be racing. And we have to be very mindful of the students who have, you know, different kinds of parts and um, really keep their self-esteem intact moving forward with what students can do and what they'll need support with in order to get to the same destination. But I also want you to think about the process again. It's not just all about the product and that motor outcome. It's also about how does the student go about showing what was learned and my hope is that learning is as joyful as possible. And I think that's where the bulk of our conversation will be for the rest of this presentation. I focused a lot on 
what are uh, slow processing speed skill concerns. And so now I want to quickly go through the element of who we're working with, who are our 2E children. So what I want to talk about are what are the non-negotiables for 2E learners in different environments. And you may see that there are five environments in this poster. I'm just going to start with anyone because they're all equally important. In terms of the intellectual piece, what needs to be in the learning environment for 2E learners is that the tasks are authentic and meaningful and have real-world application. When tasks are engaging, students kind of forget um, to resist or avoid because they love what they're learning. And um, it's helpful for students to really show what they know and dive in deep dives. So they have to have options and that leads us to the creative section. They have to have options about ways to access the curriculum, maybe having two books to read or two op an option between the two books to read, or it could be uh, listening to a video or an audio of an interview before diving into what's learned so they see a real life application. So students who have choice are much more engaged. And when the intellectual or cognitive level is challenging and they have creative choice, then students are more willing to take the support that they need for their executive functioning skills and for their slower processing speed skills, which again are sometimes confusing for, for individuals because they both impact each other. The next area that I'll talk about, I'm going to skip over to social. In the classroom, whether, um, the, the, well, whether it's a whole class or a small group or paired learning, students need to feel a sense of belonging. And they need to know what their role is as social contributors to a group. So it might be that um, one student is coming to a group and has the role of a, of a researcher. And they're coming in with information that they found in another source. Another student might be someone who is a practical manager and is going to remember the due dates. Another student might be the note taker, not likely the one with slow processing speed skills. But this is why it's good to know who's who, because then we know what to rely on and we want to be able to rely on skills that are intact and abilities that are intact. So teachers establish rapport, teachers and students in social learning environments because everything is social in a classroom. That kind of environment, the teacher setting the tone, and the teacher shows respect for the student. And 2E students need to feel that respect and that connection and that rapport. If that's missing and can't be repaired, or it never was established, then it's even harder for a student with slow processing speed to be able to write a response because of all of the uh, issues related to relationship with the teacher. The next environment we'll talk about is emotional. Um, uh, uh, students need to know that there's a safe, we call it psychologically safe environment, where they can express their joy in learning. And a lot of kids hide that, depending on the environment that they're in. But also that it's safe to make mistakes, that mistakes are welcome. And for students with slow processing speed, they really feel, um, that, well, many feel that, that it's just known, it's so obvious you know, that their rate of learning isn't like others. And so they can be very sensitive and compare themselves to others. And that kind of comparison isn't helpful and it isn't healthy because we'll all do things different ways and still get to the end. So having a culture of acceptance and being, being able to talk about skills in a very um, clean and clear way enables students to uh, gain self-confidence despite weak areas because there's also a focus on these areas of cognitive superior skills. And then the fifth environment, I'm really whipping through these, but the fifth environment has to do with um, what needs to be in place, what's non-negotiable for some learners. And that would include allowing movement. Movement is allowed for 2E students to engage in learning. And so that might mean where they sit. And where they sit might impact their processing speed. So note the child's um, posture. Note if there are two elbows on the table. Note if they're crouched over their keyboard. Note if the lighting is good enough. Note if it, the student is distractible. Um, so, you know, these are all really important aspects. And if we look at processing speed skills, you know, I think if a student had slow processing speed skills, it's going to show up in almost every one of these environments, isn't it? 
So that's really pretty important to remember. So what is the priority when you're doing a task analysis? Is it that the student works independently and quickly and has all the right answers and it's all product oriented? Or is, is it possible to look at other areas that can be nurtured and bolstered? And thinking about processing speed skills in these five environments, it becomes very clear how sensitive we need to be with students who have slow processing speed skills. And also for those who have very quick processing speed skills where they need to slow down and be more aware of their process. So I'm talking a lot about process and really de-emphasizing product, even though that's scary for many of us because the product is what the grade is based on. So I've prepared this, this section now where what do we do? What are the accommodations? What are the modifications? What can be done? And I've broken this up into elementary, middle, high school, and then adult. And you've got these great boxes, so let's just go through these. So what would we recommend for students at school? So the red box has to do with establishing routines. So until students can do this on their own, until they can be autonomous with, their, with, with themselves, the adults in the learning environments have to provide this for students. So that's parents at home and teachers at school. And sometimes with, when students are being homeschooled, it's one and the same. And during the pandemic, it was one and the same. So many of you know more about your children's processing speed skills because of the pandemic than you might have otherwise. But anyway, it's really important to establish routines. Now think about input, output, think about the student's capabilities. Is it best to establish routines and structure time and space with words because the student's highly verbal or with a visual calendar and visual reminders because the student is highly uh, visual spatial. So there isn't one right way for every student. We really have to think about, well, what are the student's capabilities? What will be meaningful for that student? So structuring time can be emphasizing the passage of time. So that means having a clock face as opposed to a digital clock. So an analog clock can be very helpful for many students because then they see how long they've been thinking about an answer and how much time is left to produce it. Now that's not great for all students, I'm sure many of you parents know this, but it could make your child more anxious to see a clock. And so that might not be the best way for them. So there isn't one right way to go about this, but there are many questions to ask about whether or not it'll work. And then, of course, it can be tried. So how do we, uh, how do we structure space? Well, we look at the area where the student is sitting, and we look at how many breaks are needed, and we look at whether a motor break is helpful between a task that has been uh, man st well structured into smaller, more manageable parts. So I'm sure many of you have at home established routines where your child comes in the door and puts their backpack in the same location every day. Now, this might sound like we're talking about a student with attentional issues, but students with processing speed may also have attentional issues. So clarifying the expectations for establishing routines is really helpful, even though it sounds like it might be something that we might do for a student with attentional issues. So structuring time and space to make a routine is great because the more often we do routines, the, the stronger students get. Remember we were talking about fluency? Now again, some kids don't respond to routines. You're still doing the same thing that you've done for a long period of time and you may be feeling frustrated with your child. And so what's important is just to keep scaffolding those executive functioning skills and enabling routines to one day get better. Because I'm sure you all know, and I would love to see the chat to, when I pose this, but maybe I'll just do that. I'll pose it and then Callie and Yael, you can tell me. But you know, does saying hurry up or rush or, or go quicker, does that help? You know, thumbs up, thumbs down? No, it just doesn't work. So our losing our frustration, our getting frustrated and losing our parental cool doesn't help. So we really want our students to, or our children to establish routines and kind of be independent, but we're really in this for the long haul. Like I said about the car, the car engine and the car makeup, you know, we're all going to go, let's just go back to that car analogy for a second. We're, let's say we're all going on a road trip. Okay. And we're all in our cars. Let's just go back to this little image here. Right here. 
um, we're all, all, all in our cars and I'm in Los Angeles. So let's say I'm going to go up to the Northern California coast and we're all gonna get into these cars, right? So those of us with fast processing speed are gonna to wanna to gun the pedal to the metal and wanna get there maybe fast, right? Or fastest or first. And others of us might wanna stop along the roadside and get a snack. Maybe that's just me. Or you may be taking a little detour and looking at this little area or going to the coast along the way. So it's like things catch our interest and we're all motivated in different ways. Some of us might be motivated to take more breaks. Some of us might be motivated to get there fast. Some of us might, you know, want to just, as I said, gun it. So there are so many issues related to motivation and interest, but we can't drive through stop signs. We have to recognize when it's time to stop and when it's time to pause, right? We don't want a speeding ticket on the way we're getting. And we might need to take a break and someone else might need to drive the car. So you kind of get where I'm going with this kind of analogy. I just kind of wanted to come back there and reiterate that we're, when we're in a family, on a family trip in a car, we have all the different needs in the family. And that trip is going to be fun. So parents know that they're going to plan for that. And I'm thinking maybe we could do that for students who have slow processing speed during homework time. So keep that in mind for a moment. Students with slow processing speed, I'm gonna to go to this kind of yellow box. They need more time to transition. Now at home, that's about getting in the car. I think many of you as parents say, okay, we're gonna leave in 10 minutes, we're gonna leave in five minutes, we're gonna leave in two minutes, we're gonna leave now. Um, that's very common. Another way to kind of help that transition is to say, look around and tell me what you need to pick up or pack. And what that requires parents is that you have all the time in the world. So I know that's not always realistic, but to whatever extent you can allow yourself to create that time, these kinds of transitions will be lovely. And I, I'm gonna give another example because I'm hoping that the examples are helpful. At Bridges Academy, where I uh, consult, there is a lovely time of day between classes where there isn't a bell system. So the students are attuned to the teachers giving directions that it's time to go outside and the teachers determine that based on the students readiness. And then they go outside and they play or they have a snack and then when it's time to come back into class, they look at the visual field because either the teacher or the teacher's assistant has come out and the kids gravitate around the teacher or the teacher's assistant and then they go enter class. But they don't enter class until they've had a conversation, the teacher greets the students, so it's a lovely, what I call a soft transition. If a student were in a traditional classroom, there would be a lot of difficulties during this time period, don't you think? So what happens at home is that we as parents are juggling a lot and we wanna rush and we wanna get there or we wanna do whatever. And we have to be able to remember what it's like to have this kind of a soft transition. Now, sometimes it's not possible. We just have to get there. But other times it is possible. So consider how might you make a transition at home possible. Um, and then, you know, being able to give the clues. Is the student going to listen to verbal prompts or visual prompts? And um, kind of lay things out, whether it's clothes or materials, having a drop spot, making things as easy as possible. I'll go to the next box, which is green. So this uh, checking in for accurate perceptions. So this is a big one, and this is more related to executive functioning skills, the way I, I teach it. So in executive functioning skills, I'll just say that most parents are most concerned with being, their children being organized and meeting deadlines. But there are a lot of skills that are required before that can occur. One of the very first executive functioning skills is making sure that the student has an accurate perception of what's expected. And so accurate perceptions could be knowing the oral directions, or it could be um, knowing what the product might look like. But again, there's such a focus on product that we also wanna make sure that we are guiding the student with the learning process. So how is the student thinking about the directions? How is the student thinking about next steps? If we ask the student how they're thinking and what they're perceiving, then we have a better sense of where that student is on the right track and we can say, great, I like how you're thinking. 
or whether the student is, is misperceiving or has missed a cue and we have to provide that or reframe it. So I'm not going to talk about this for much longer, although I could, but that's a different topic uh, on executive functioning. But if a student um, is expecting uh, a very complicated written response and the time frame isn't um, possible for such a complicated project, then we then the teacher or the, the parent has to reframe what's possible within that time frame. Looking to the box on the right, prompting for initiation of tasks, providing feedback for ongoing process progress. Again, this is very much attuned to what students who have attentional issues need, um, and also students with anxiety. Sometimes students don't get started. The longer that they've talked about the instructions or the rationale for not having to do it, <laughs> they could have finished the task already, right? So these are highly verbal students. Again, it's the highly verbal skills that are being shown off in this kind of negotiating. It goes back to the important intellectual environment here where students who are really interested and engaged and motivated, they're more likely to take the prompts for processing speed and executive functioning because they're loving what they're doing and it's meaningful. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what students need to initiate a task and what kind of feedback is provided for their ongoing progress. When students hear that they're on track or that someone likes how they're thinking, it can make a huge difference. And most of the time as parents, we just want our kids to do it and we want them to do it without our asking first. And then when they finally do it, we're, we're silent. So we have to give as many prompts for when the students are doing what we're asking versus when they're not. So keep that in mind too. The blue box talks about the language that we can use when we're working with children. So I like to be very specific. I'm sure you've all heard this before, but we can say something like, I noticed how well you're doing X and make sure that X is very specific to the task. Don't just say you're doing a good job. Just say, I really like how you gathered your backpack before I asked you to, or I really like how you're thinking about this answer, or I really like that you're looking online for this. That's exactly the right place to be looking for it. So when you give specific feedback, the child gets the message that they're on the right track, but it also gives the child a sense of where support might be needed next. And that has to do with self-advocacy. Now, some students can ask about their learning needs, and other times it's the teacher or the parent that has to solve the mystery of what's really going on. And so a self-advocacy can take place when a student has self-confidence and rapport with the adults and feels that it's safe to do so. Self-advocacy is based on a student knowing what they can do well as well as knowing what they need support with. And an example I can give you as adults is think of something in your adult life. You can put it in the chat. What's something in your adult life that you could do but it would take you forever and you'd rather pay someone else to do it or you'd rather someone else helped you out? right? You as an adult, you can choose to do that. If you have the funds, you can pay for someone to do it, right? Mow the lawn, fixing appliances, taxes, laundry, folding laundry. Right. Okay. Change so, the oil. Right. Exactly. That's exactly, those are the perfect kinds of answers. So this is real life. So what I'm saying here is that we know we could do it. We could do it well if we had two weeks, but we really need to do it now for whatever reasons. So how do we get over that hump of the kind of thinking that we have going on in our heads, that kind of self-talk? Um, I wonder if I should say this here. I think I will. What we're talking about now is another executive functioning skill where students are uh, either talking themselves towards a task or away from a task. And it's, it's like uh, modifying, not modifying, it's kind of... Um, it, it, that self-talk can either be helpful or not. And I'll give an example uh, that um, I often use, and that's um, I love potato chips and french fries for that matter. Um, and when I see a bag of potato chips, I just want them. They're not on my diet. I'm not supposed to have them, but I want them. I'm sure you all can relate, be it potato chips or pretzels or whatever you love. So I can see a bag of pretzels, and I might think to myself, Again, I'm giving you an example of what it's like to think things through. I can say, mm, I'd really love that bag of potato chips. And that could propel me towards it. 
I could also say, no, they're not on my diet. I'm going to be disciplined. I'm not going to have them today. So students are having that same kind of internal dialogue. And they're, they're modulating that dialogue in a way to protect themselves, either from humiliation or from being found out that they're not going to be good at it or whatever. And sometimes they don't say it out loud. So we have to be able to ask the right questions to find out how kids are thinking. Because I can modulate thoughts that will enable me to avoid those potato chips or to just eat them. And then what about the thoughts that I might be thinking after I've had the bag? Are the thoughts going to be self-critical? Are the thoughts going to be encouraging? Oh, maybe next time I won't eat them. So it's like kids are having this dialogue and we're not necessarily checking in with them about how they're thinking about their learning process. And if processing speed is a big issue, then what do you imagine they're thinking? This is going to take forever. I don't want to have to do this. I have to work harder than everybody else. They're going to finish before I do. And some of that may not be an accurate perception looking at the green box. It could be completely inaccurate. So we really need to be able to check in with students, whether we're the teachers or the parents, to find out how they're thinking. Because if they know their strengths, talents, and interests, then they can put in perspective their slower processing speed or their too quick processing speed so that it's relevant for the task at hand and that they know what to ask for, how to ask for it, and when to ask for it, which are also more executive functioning skills. So in the purple box, I was talking about content areas. I'm really talking about writing, where I've written that students should be allowed to provide bulleted answers as opposed to full sentences. Students should be allowed to dictate their answers to a scribe, whether it's a peer or an adult or a parent during homework. Students should be allowed to provide fewer items once mastery is shown. Um, a common example of that is like every third problem in math you know, if it's a lot of math items. But then again, in math, which requires a written response, there should be fewer items per page, so it's not so overwhelming for a student with processing speed issues. And there should be a great deal of white space to record answers for le legibility in particular. And then, of course, I have allowing choice, which I've already talked about in terms of one of the non-negotiable uh, environments of creativity. So these school recommendations are, are much easier to implement in elementary school. And it's much easier to allow a student in elementary school to dictate their answers. And often parents will ask me, should I allow my child to dictate? And my answer is always yes, because what's the point? Let's do the task analysis. What's the point of the assignment? Is the point that the, your child has to write it out and it take for you know an hour and a half? Or is the point to learn what's being taught show that learning took place, dictation helps that student along. So I don't see it as a crutch. Once a student can write on their own, they're not going to want to dictate. Once a student can write within the time period available, they're not going to want to um, use a alternate way of doing things. So I trust students. I think you should, I think you also trust your children. So a lot of the school recommendations here in terms of processing speed are related to transition times during the day, and they're related to written responses. And then also don't forget an oral response. Some students need to know the questions in advance so they can provide an oral response before being called on because they need time to formulate their answer. So the next section has to do with, well, what do we do for students in middle school? And guess what? The answer is the same as what you do in elementary school. The biggest difference is that many middle school teachers expect students to be autonomous and independent, and they're not yet. And then parents expect their students to be autonomous, and they're not yet. So a lot of the same issues uh, exist here, although there may be more standardized testing, and there may be longer projects, and there may be um, issues that need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis in middle school. Um, extended time becomes more of a factor. And prompting and scaffolding for next steps becomes a factor in middle school. And then my next slide, of course, is high school and more of the same. What we tend to see in high school is that students are cognitively ready for AP courses and honors courses but they aren't able to keep up with the, the production demands 
of writing um, different responses to reading. And they're not ready for essay writing every week. And they're just, it's just a lot of repetitive written work. So there's that issue. Okay, how do students then access the content in an AP class, which then, of course, leads to other um, benefits at the high school, or at the college level? But how to how to handle that? Do um, what kind of support can a student have? Can a student work with a tutor to move things along? Can the student use an audio recorder? Can a student um, have choice with showing how something has been learned? And um, the college level, it's more of the same. Um, I think there are some parents here that have college age students and there was a question about how to handle a college application process. Well, can you imagine for a student with slow processing speed needing to juggle the current demands in high school, having to add to that applications and deadlines and essays while maintaining grades at school? So when is there time in the day for students to both apply to school and keep up their grades in high school. So the, the biggest issue for college is finding the support for students so they don't feel so overwhelmed. Um, overwhelm, I don't think I've talked about that yet. I've really talked more about frustration levels and anxiety. But when there's a sense of overwhelm for a student with slow processing speed, it feels as if we're never going to be able to finish. That no matter how much effort, I'm not going to be able to finish. And why bother? And there's a defeatist attitude. And when it's a why bother situation, then we're not seeing what's in this blue square here, which is a student asking for assistance. So self-advocacy is so huge because we want students to be very aware of their profiles and have a sense of ownership about both their strengths and any weaknesses and be able to ask for the help that's needed. So I often teach students how to ask for help so that um, it's really well received by adults in their environment. But self-advocacy in college can be very hard for a student who doesn't have a sense of their asynchronous learning profile. It's much easier in elementary school because of the developmental stage that students are in. It's really hard in middle school. I don't know why it's so hard. I think middle school uh, educators feel they're preparing students for the real world in high school. But then it's easier in high school for students to get accommodations through an IEP or a 504 and um, then in college, of course, everything that's been established in high school continues after K through 12. But in college, students have to bring to the attention their issues in the student learning center. Whereas in K through 12, it's the educators who check in with the children. In college, the children have to check in with the educators. Otherwise, the educators don't know that there's an issue. So self-advocacy becomes a big issue. And a very common uh, accommodation is extended time, either 50% or 100%. But that's not enough to solve all of the issues we've been talking about. It's, it's, it's an option, but it doesn't solve. So that's why it's so important to know what is possible, and then also what are the non-negotiables, and then also to be able to identify in terms of task analysis, what's the most important thing here? And then also having a sense of how to have compassion for a student who's proving every day some of the weaker skills that they have. So I'm gonna be wrapping up in a few, mom a few moments. I know we didn't solve all of the world's problems tonight and not anything is going away rather quickly, but it's, it's really important to think about it. And for those of you who are more visual, spatial than verbal, I have these gorgeous images. You may notice that I've chosen a land animal, a winged animal, a water animal, and a human, all sentient beings. And what I want to talk about with you is that we have to consider the context and expectations. We would never expect a hummingbird to run like a lion. We wouldn't ever expect a hummingbird to behave like a turtle. But I feel like we can lose that fact very easily with asynchronous learners and especially those with slow processing speed which impacts all other kinds of learning issues that are co-occurring. So you know really think about what it is that's make or break for the kids and think about ways in which they can be supported to be their you know their best selves with their self-confidence intact. Um, the next 
section is that remember I told you earlier on that the, that I don't often see processing speed skills improve but I do see them improve along with other uh, skills. I play a lot of games with students, card games. They can be homemade, they don't have to be store-bought, but I use the game Blink a lot. Have you heard of Blink? B-L-I-N-K? Blink is a fun card game for all ages, adults as well. And students, the goal of the game is to be able to get rid of all your cards, but the only way to get rid of your cards is by placing one of your cards on a pile. And the images on the cards are all nonverbal, so they're either one, two, three, four, or five images. So they're either based on color, on number, or by the symbol. So students who first play this game with me, are very, who have slow processing speed, are very awkward. And again, if we do task analysis, this is a visual nonverbal input, and it requires a tactile input because students are holding cards in their hand. And the output is fine motor or gross motor if they drop a card and they have to bend down to pick it up. So it's that kind of a task, visual, nonverbal, and then um, fine motor response. And um, the students start first, when they first start to play it, if they have slow processing speed, they tend to place a card that's only number or only the shape or only the color. As they begin to juggle handling all three, number, color, and shape, they begin to beat me. And once they beat me, I can never beat them again. So yes, processing speed can in, uh, improve, but tied to, in this case, visual spatial scanning and motor dexterity. Marcy. Yes. I wanted to mention that someone in the chat brought up a game that I know you and I talked about was Spot. Yes, Spot is fine. <laughs> spot it, it's Spot it, I think. Yeah, spot it, absolutely. And you can put in all the games in the chat and we can share them with each other. Um, many students will, who have slow processing speed will never gravitate or choose a game that requires speed. They just won't, it's not fun for them. So it has to be presented if it's with a family, it has to be presented in a way that the student is really learning something meaningful or is excited about it. But these are wonderful ways to improve uh, processing speed. Um, did I talk about um, waiving mad minute, waiving math fluency assessments? I don't think I did, did I? Um, on this slide, I'll go back for a moment. I know I'm trying to wrap up, but I'm also thinking about things that are important. On school recommendations, for a student with slow processing speed, I like to waive any mad minute or math fluency assignments because that's just making the child prove over and over again that they don't know their math facts quickly. And a use of a calculator can be very helpful. Playing games with math numbers and math facts can be fun. Again, we want learning to be joyful, but we don't want students to keep proving their disability, especially when they've got superior skills and they're twice exceptional. So um, waiving any timed tasks is really important at school, whether it is elementary, middle, high school. Okay, coming back to this beautiful visual imagery. So we would never expect an, uh, an animal to behave like a different animal. We don't want to expect our students and children who are slow processors to suddenly be, be, be fast processors, even though it would make our lives and days so much easier. So keep considering the context and the expectations. And then um, recognize that when students practice tasks tied to other skills, they do improve over time. But the games, if you're parents and you're playing at home, the games have to be low key, high interest. They have to have personal meaning for your child. They have to be personally motivated to win the game and handle losing, right? So those are some social emotional issues and it must be joyful. And the second it's not, stop it. Indicate or present it to your child that this is for fun, we're having fun. And I wish homework could be this way as well. I wish homework could be a fun, period of time and maybe you can introduce a game in between homework tasks or play a game after homework. So um, games are, are really a fantastic way to teach skills and I love to play games with middle school students and high school students because I feel like we've lost out in a couple of years of those board games. We've moved right into internet games so I'm encouraging everyone to play fun games. Um, this is another beautiful page where I've brought in some imagery for all of you visual spatial learners and not as much language. 
um, I want to talk about some final reflections, which is taking lessons from nature. So you see that again, I've picked the different elements. So I have this beautiful crushing wave that I imagine is somewhere in Fiji or Hawaii or somewhere with some fabulous beach. You know, think about the joy of watching the sea if you live near a coast and think about the, the swell of a wave and think of the crest and think of the crashing and how each of those aspects of a wave are so pleasurable. It's not like we're looking at a wave and only looking at the product. Like, and first of all, is the product the crest? Is the product the crash? Like what, anyway, what is it? So in nature, we are shown progress and process. There isn't one aspect that's more important than another. That's very helpful for a student with slow processing speed because no one sits on the beach looking at the waves and times them and say, oh, that one's taking two minutes longer to swell. Or, you know, when's the next wave coming? It's supposed to be here already. Like those aren't thoughts we ever have. So let's take this lesson from nature. And I'm hoping that you'll remember the ocean waves when you're working with your um, children. Same thing with, I, I picked sunflowers. You know, they grow into tall stalks and they only um, bloom in the summer, right? Do they bloom in the spring? Maybe I'm wrong. But sunflowers I associate with summer. We never expect them to bloom in winter, right? It's just we wouldn't think about it. So again, what are we expecting our children to do? And can we look at lit lessons from nature? Same thing with the cherry blossoms that I have a photo of. And um, and I've got a really nice beach there. So to, to I'm just gonna wrap up and give us time to uh, ask, ask and answer questions. We're looking at learning as being a joyful process and it's a natural process. And we can take these lessons from nature and, and really look at what our children are able to do and protect their self-confidence and their self-advocacy, foster their sense of self and esteem as learners in the world. And we trust that when they become autonomous, they won't need us anymore. But until they're autonomous, they need these supports. I never view them as a crutch. So I hope that I've, I've really set that across. What do I have left? Oh, this is the resources. I gave you an article from understood.com. There isn't a lot written about processing speed because it's very hard to separate it out from other learning skills. And that's why I think so many of you were interested in tonight's talk. And um, the next thing is playing games to improve processing speed skills along with other skills. They may be language-based. They may be visual-spatial. They may be sequencing. They may be associative, lots of games out there. I have spotted and blink listed, so thank you to whoever contributed that earlier. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah, it is. And um, I wanna thank you for um, inviting me here to talk about this. I know that it's something that everyone's concerned about and that we have an idea that slow processing speed needs to improve. And I'm asking everyone here tonight to think about what can we do in the context of learning that enables students to really shine and be who they are and live their magic without processing speed being as integral an issue as we thought it was? So maybe you have a different view and your perspective has shifted after this um, brief presentation. So again, thank you. Marcy, can you put your contact slide up and we'll uh, put your contact information in the chat? because I'm not, I know I have a different email address for you, but there, I put that one in the chat, so great. So Marcy, thank you so much. This presentation is chock full of information, um, no doubt. And we actually had like 13 or 14 questions come in the chat, and I know we got a little bit of a late start, so I wondered if you would be willing to stick around a little longer yeah. to, to answer some of these questions. Um, and yeah, El, I don't know what questions stood out to you, but I just started at the top and kind of jotted them down from top to bottom, which which first was, you know, how how do you differentiate between um, slow processing and dysgraphia? Well, they're, they're very much the same issue. If you do task analysis and you look at the input and the output. So um, dysgraphia, is a learning disability, a specific learning disability, where students have difficulty forming letters, and that can be um, sequencing, you know, literally knowing how to, where to put the pencil to start the letter. Is it a bottom up or a top down? Is there a curvilinear line? Um, so 
that is very specific to uh, forming letters and numbers uh, with paper and pencil. And slow processing speed can uh, impact that. And also the um, dyslexia can impact slow processing speed. So students who have difficulty with writing, we tend to bypass it by um, having students start to keyboard as soon as possible or to use special pencil grips or to be able, as we mentioned already, dictate their answers. So there's a huge overlap between slow processing speed and dysgraphia, mm -hmm. mostly because of the motor response that we talked about earlier. And I think the response that I gave when this question came up was, you know, just the importance of a thorough evaluation with some with a neuropsych or an ed psych who really understands these issues very thoroughly and can really tease apart what's what's going on. Um, because it can, all these things do overlap and can get very complicated. Um, Absolutely. And excuse me, I, I want to say one more thing. They're yeah. measured differently. So dyslexia is, you know, the, the assessments for dyslexia are different than processing speed. What about so for dysgraphia? Be, I'm sorry, dysgraphia. Yeah, and it's this, the, um, the assessments are different. Yes, okay. Um, are there specific assessments families should ask for to sort of suss that out? Um, I would leave it up to the evaluator. I, I think sharing the, your observations of what's going on with a child uh, when talking with an evaluator helps that evaluator decide which uh, measures to use. Well, and then we had a couple questions around ADHD and, you know, whether untreated ADHD might impact processing speed. And kind of on a similar note was, you know, if, if pharmacological treatment, pharmacological treatment of ADHD could help with positive uh, processing speed. Okay. I have seen students who were diagnosed with ADHD and whose parents, um, put in place quite a few recommendations, including medication. And that student, these students were able to answer questions with greater fluency. So the oral fluency improved. So the response time between being asked a question and responding to a question improved. And also written response because attentional issues had improved. So I have seen that there are gains, but under those conditions, so it's not a direct line because, as I've mentioned, the parents uh, received quite a few recommendations and implemented them. It wasn't only medication. So it's not a direct line. But I have seen students processing speed, oral and motor, uh, improve once they are on the right medication and titration has occurred. And it depends on any co-occurring issues. And of course, we should say we're not medical professionals, so if medication is something you want to pursue, make sure you're working with a good medical doctor or psychiatrist who can really help you figure out what's best for your child and monitor monitor that. So, Absolutely. Um, One question that stood out to me because my child is like this, he actually has, I know often uh, working memory and processing speed are, are linked, uh, but in my child's case, and someone else asked this as well, they have a superior working memory, 99%, but only average or low processing speed. And how does that show up? What kind of impacts might that have? Superior working memory? Superior working memory with slow processing speed, both at the same time. Yeah, see, this is difficult for students, you know. So um, superior working memory uh, indicates that that student can juggle. That student can handle different elements uh, simultaneously. So those of us with superior process working memory we're short order chefs, we're airplane pilots, we're parents. Um, we don't let a lot of balls, you know, drop, you know, we're holding on to them. Those who have weaker active working memory tend to do deep dives because they can do one thing really well and not juggle a lot of different pieces in their learning. So that's a sign of it. So um, those who have really superior working memory, they can think of a lot of ideas, but then when it comes time to produce their ideas, it's really hard to move to production because it's so exciting to be thinking about that. They're capable of it. It's kind of what I was mentioning at the very beginning about preparing for a worksheet. Worksheets and students who have superior skills are really tough to narrow down the answer because there could be multiple excellent answers. 
So active working memory is about juggling. Processing speed is about the speed at which the answer is provided. So um, active working memory can really um, impact a learner because they've got these great ideas, but it's going to be so effortful to produce them. And so the what so can you talking do to about support, process? What, yeah, what do you do to support that kind of learner? So as with all students, all 2E learners, it's really important that they know their strengths, gifts, and talents, and they know what skills they can rely on day in and day out. You can have this conversation with a very young child and also with an adult. So what skills can they rely on that they know are theirs? And then what skills need to be supported? And where does that individual want the support to come from? Do they want the support to come from a parent? And if so, which parent? A sibling? A teacher? If so, which teacher? Who's the best delivery? Um, does the student feel comfortable asking for help? Does the student know how to ask, like literally know how to ask for help? Is it safe to ask for help? Um, so, you know, there is a lot that we can do to talk about students' learning profiles from a strength-based perspective, knowing what, what they can do easily and what they can rely on and what they need help with. Earlier, you were talking about what are the adult tasks that would take us a long time or that we dread, taxes being one of them. So many of us do our own taxes and some of us are quick processing that because we've kept good records and we have good executive functioning skills. Other of us just throw up our hands and we hire a tax accountant and we're willing to pay that money and we have that choice. So it's the same in talking with students, but not in a shameful way, but talking about a, an asynchronous learning profile in a way where we ask the students, how do you want to be seen? How do you want to be seen by your teacher? How do you want to be seen by your peers? How do you want how do you want to see yourself as a learner? A learner of the world, not someone who gets to the answer quickly. I didn't mention that there's always somebody in a class who's saying, done, finished, hands up. What do I do next? And that can make other students who have slower processing speed feel pretty badly because they want to be the first to finish, right? So talking about what it means to finish first and what it means to finish second or last talking about racing, but framing it in terms of a strength, talents, and interest. So I doubt any of your kids have, have talents and interest in actual race car driving. I doubt it, but that would be so great if they did. But think about, again, um, examples from nature and examples from what they love. Where does being quick matter and where doesn't it? I can bet that Einstein, who um, you know we know as a learner, had a lot of difficulties, but yet made so many contributions to society, we can bet he had slow processing speed, right? So how can we look at those of us that we admire in our society and enable our kids to look up to those individuals as examples, as models, and as experts? And, and kind of following up within this question, there was sort of a question embedded within it, which is that a child might have like a very superior working memory, but not have like, I mean, sometimes, I mean, honestly, we, we get emails from families who say like, my child is in the, you know, second percentile, the first percentile in, in processing speed, right? Like they're high in everything else and then they're super low. But I think what more families face is something more like where they're really superior in their working memory and they're more like low average or average in their processing speed. And then schools just think that's okay, that child's fine. They're average here, they're great there, whatever, you know. But can that be enough of a discrepancy to really cause some of the, the frustration that kids experience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if there's a one or a five, as I showed you in the, in the, in the sample of the WISC scores, that it's as if that skill's not there. And for a student who has superior uh, cognitive abilities, that's really frustrating. If a student has average processing speed, but superior cognitive abilities in the other indices, that feels like a learning disability. It feels effortful. It feels hard to get started. There's the comparison with others. So um, I think it's a big deal, but then I work with students one-on-one -on -one and I'm not in a school district and districts will um, interpret those scores in the way that you know, they see fit. So um, it's important to understand the kind of inner workings of a student to know how impacted they are by these asynchronous skills. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, is the point spread significant? And even if it's close to significant, we're asking kids to show what they've learned as a measure of assessment every day in school. And so if, if we had, if we as adults had to face something we didn't like to do, whether it's bike riding or some other motor activity like bowling, I always recommend bowling for students to go out on play dates together because neither are going to be good at it. You know, they're going to have the bumpers and they're just going to be able to do their best, you know, and in a game like that, does speed matter or does having fun matter? Mm -hmm. So you kind of get where I'm going. You know, we, we as parents have to look at what enables our children to maintain their sense of self and know who they are as a person, who they are as a person in a classroom or in the school community, who they are within our family. And not each of us are going to have equal ability. We have to be able to celebrate what we each offer and focus on that as opposed to accentuating or focusing on what's not right, what's not working, what's not good enough. That can create even more emotional issues and um, often perfectionism is a part of this, so we have to watch that carefully. But again, that's another topic. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you had any other questions. I have several. So. Um, well, somebody brought up, um, is it common not to know slower processing speeds until middle school? Um, I noticed in general that I noticed many more things in middle school when my son got there that um, weren't a problem in elementary. Um, I don't know. I, I can see it in elementary. Um, we're not looking for speed in elementary. They're still learning, right? And then in middle school, we're looking for a more automation. I mean, that really is what middle school is all about. And the load on active working memory in middle school is astronomical. Um, so the expectations are different. And I, I had mentioned earlier about understanding the context of the age and grade level expectations. Um, so yeah, they may become more noticeable in middle school, but I can see it in a student uh, in their motor uh, engagement uh, in elementary. I mean, you can tell when 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 you go different places. You know, you you may have one child who just rushes out of the car, barely looking to see if it's you know safe, and you have another student who's observing and kind of hesitating, and then you know, is still standing next to you. And there are different ways to kind of, that wasn't an example of processing speed. It's more an example of, um, you know, visual spatial, you know, checking the environment and uh, some attentional issues, but they kind of all get mixed together in real life. Well, and, and kind of related to, um, related to that, I think, you know, as, as kids progress through school, their projects do get longer, sometimes more complex, more parts to them. And so you talked a little bit about that, but like, how do you actually handle that? So if you have a child, you know, they have slow processing speed and, and you like celebrate everything that's great about them and you've got just a beautiful household going, but there's a big project and you know, it's coming. <laughs> and you, how, what, what should you actually do to support a child who has slow processing speed, who now is facing, facing that? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to that um, colored square about structuring time and space. So getting started earlier and talking through or showing a list of steps. So talking through or showing steps. So these are kind of the same things we do for a student who had, has attentional issues because it structures and makes very clear expectations and then uh, provides, um, it, it enables us to provide feedback for each of those steps so that students can keep moving along. When there are attentional issues attached to slip processing speed, kids find other things much more interesting than what's expected. And um, it requires the adults in the environment to really structure that time and space well. Now, I think I'd mentioned that um, we don't often have that time in life. There's just so much to fit into a day, but the more we are patient with ourselves, with each other and with our children, um, and the more we're clear about those expectations, the better. Mm -hmm. So typically I like to make sure that a student has accurate perceptions for what the assignment will be. So first of all, are we thinking about the same assignment? What will be required? Um, will a parent need to take a trip to the store? Um, you know, does the student have to have other materials that they've got to gather somewhere at the library on school's campus or something? Um, so what will be, what will be entailed? And then uh, who's going to do it? Assigning who's going to do it? 
-hmm. If the student is going to need to read, is the student going to need to interview? Is the student going to need to listen or watch? So depending on what it is that the student has to do to take in the information, then what are the choices for a student to show what was learned? Can there be options beyond the written response? Mm -hmm. And um, that's really ideal for all kinds of asynchronous learners, but especially those with slow processing speed. Mm -hmm. So during that kind of a multi-step project that takes time, where can that student be supported that would make uh, things seem less effortful? Where, where can a parent or even a teacher say, how can I help you? I, but I don't like to use the word help, but how can I be of assistance? What would you like me to do? Find out from the student what the student is excited about doing or what the student is willing to let someone else do. I find working with uh, clients, um, they don't want me to do their work for them. Like, you know, like I said earlier, there's no crutch in this conversation. Everyone's worried about things being a crutch and not being the real world. But the truth is, is that students grow into these skills, even if they continue to have slower processing speed, but they grow into these skills. And as soon as they're independent, they're autonomous learners, which is our goal. That's the goal of educational therapy. So it's not forever. So asking your child or asking your student, how can I be of help to you? Or how can I be of assistance? really gives an empowering sense to the student to make that determination. Mm -hmm. But we have to have a strong enough relationship that we don't think that the student will take advantage. And we have to have a strong enough relationship that the student isn't going to come to a different conclusion about that interaction. We don't want a student thinking, oh, I did it again. I'm not good at this. I don't want to do this. Have that dread, have that avoidance, have that negotiating. Rather, we want to be teaching life skills which is how do you interact with another individual when we both need to work together and support each other? That's the real world. What so I I'm more interested in how students are integrating their learning experience in a way that maintains their self-esteem and self-confidence um, than I am looking at specific processing speed because there's so much to look at. Well, I think what you're saying I, I kind of want to tie a couple questions together and we probably have three or four more questions left just to give you a little sense for timing and, and maybe think about your timing. But I think what you're talking about too is like, we talked a little bit about self-advocacy, but are there like specific ways um, kids at different ages, whatever, can talk about their slow processing speed and what their needs are? Because it's so processing, processing speed isn't always something that's really well known, but there must be ways for kids to words and language kids can use so that they can help people understand what will help them be at their best. And this sort of ties into a question that someone asked about, about college, you know, and this feeling that maybe there are a lot of accommodations you can ask for in high school, but then what happens in college if, if professors aren't as flexible which hasn't always been my experience. I see a lot of professors, a lot of colleges really embracing universal design for learning, but you know, there will be those situations throughout your life where you're gonna run into people who don't understand or maybe aren't as flexible and you need to explain to them what will help you work and self-advocate. So what is like language you might recommend or what, what do you coach kids to say? Um, okay, I want, I, I'm gonna answer that in a sec, but something's caught my eye. Um... And it's in the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, where did it go? <laughs> um, okay, where do you find trained people? Okay, I wanted to say something. You know, um, as educational therapists, rarely does a student come to us to work with them on slow processing speed. That just, that just isn't how it happens. We might have students come to us because they need support with school, handing in assignments on time, um, you know, we, we aren't looking at processing speed per se, but we have to identify what it is that's getting in the way. So to focus in on processing speed in and of itself is kind of missing the bigger picture, which is what the context was that I was referencing earlier. So I just wanted to make sure I clarified um, that. It's processing speed in relation to school functioning. Um, so you know, what is good language? So, you know, a student um, might be able to say, I really am excited about this project. It may be um, such a huge project that I don't know if I have the time to complete it. You know, it needs to be handed in on Friday or it needs to be handed in in two weeks. So asking the teacher, you know, a question about, do you think this is reasonable within this time frame? 
I know it takes me longer to do something than most. I mean, gosh, doesn't that sound adult-like? Wouldn't you love to hear your child say something like that? So that would require a lot of support, a lot of, you know, parents or teachers supporting a child to have that much confidence in a learning situation. Um, so we're really talking about building confidence and saying things like, I, I know I can do this, but it may take me longer. Or I know I can do this, but I may need to talk about it with you first before I get started. Or I know I can do this, but I may need someone else to write it for me. Or I know I can do this, but... So it's, it's indicating what I am able to do and what I know combined with where it's very effortful and where I'm going to need support. Um, it's a very balanced way to ask a question. It's a very balanced way to self-advocate. If I went to a university instructor and, I, and, and just threw up my hands and say, I don't even know what to do. Like the university instructor is not going to want to help me out, <laughs> first of all, because I'll look unregulated, right? But if I go to a university professor and I say, you know, I've read the chapter and I answered the questions at the end of the chapter and I felt like I understood it. But then when you discuss this concept in class today, I felt lost again. Now the instructor has a place to start because the instructor knows what I've done and that I've made some effort towards that goal. I've talked about my process and then the instructor can jump in. It's not too big of a question. And it's not too small of a question where the instructor can just send me back and say, well, just look on page 72 or look at the chart on 104. So looking at the context and having words to describe um, a learning profile that isn't judgmental is key. And usually when we are in a rush and we are being demanding and we want our kids to get ready or to go or to, you know, whatever, um, that's not the time when we're at our best selves. So we have to remind ourselves what are the words that we want our child to internalize. So the more you can be non-judgmental, the more you can be clear in expectations, and the more you can um, really feel for what the child is going through, then we're working together as a team, and there's a sense of belonging and a tremendous amount of support. So I'm hoping that I gave you enough examples for a young child as well as for an adult that you have a sense of how to use words that really encourage acceptance and excitement. And knowing that, you know, we don't have that option every day and every night in our lives. We just, we're just human, but we've got to do the best we can. Marcy, one thing you sparked for me is my son was having a lot of meltdowns when homework was assigned and it was because he is has slow processing speed. He wasn't able to articulate. I know this is going to take me forever. Um, but after having the conversation, which I hope he can have eventually on his own, but with the teachers to help them understand what's going on when they're assigning homework, they actually came up with the idea of creating a study hall for him. And that has been life-changing. So he now knows when he's assigned the homework, that there's an extra time during the day that he will have to work on it. And he doesn't have to have a meltdown. Um, so anyway, just wanted to throw that out there as an option for people because that was, um, Life changing. Yeah. So again, I want to just kind of break that down. So there's an extra time and space built into the day where kids aren't in trouble because they needed more time. And then they're completely free to do what they love outside of school. So when I was talking about structuring time and space, that's a beautiful example. Not all schools are set up that way. So if at home you're doing homework and other kids are in the family are finished with their work and they're playing in the background, that's going to compound the difficulties the child with slow processing speed has. So I had talked about earlier about what motivates your child and thinking about what, what can be done at the end of that homework period or that homework time. Sometimes just having that child get through the work as quickly as possible is best. So you can make that determination on the day. It doesn't have to be that way every day. But you can say, it sounds like there's something fun that we can do as a family. Let's finish this as quickly as we can. How can I be helpful? Love it. So the, I, I know we, I want to be mindful of time. I don't know. Uh, there's a couple questions about oral um, uh, processing speed. One says, when your child asks a question and takes, when you ask a question and it takes the child so long to answer, like how was your day or what was your favorite part of the birthday party? Is it best to just wait and wait if it takes so long to answer? Is it best to prompt? Socially, this can be a big issue where they get left behind in a conversation. Okay, that's a fantastic question. And that kind of veers us into language processing. 
you know, which is a whole nother subject. So it's important, first of all, to recognize the type. And again, I'm doing the same thing I do as I've shown you earlier tonight, which is what's being perceived and what is the out, what is the expected outcome. So the child is perceiving a very open-ended question, and that can be difficult for some students for a lot of different reasons. So it's really important to ask a question that is answerable without it... Um, without it opening up so many options. So instead of my saying, how's your day? A tight question. He says, ask huh? me a my son says, ask me a tight question. Right, oh yeah, perfect, asking a tight question. So just like the example of going to an instructor and saying, I don't know what to do. You know, that's not, you can even do that with your spouse. <laughs> it's not gonna be met with a very, <laughs> a very positive reaction, I don't think. So, you know, for a child, you know, you really do want to, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. So what was your question again? I apologize. It was how to help a child who's taking a long time to answer basic questions. Like how was the birthday oh, yeah. party? How was your day? Yeah. So, you know, instead say, who did you sit with at lunch today? So the assumption is that something positive happened, you know, or, you know, anything that's like that. So some, a question where there are two known answers, not like 400 unknown answers. There are also emotional issues. Now, sometimes parents have the need to know, and I know none of you here are like this, but you know, the parents have the need to know and you're asking in the car on the way home, your child's not thinking about it in that moment, right? So be talk, think about time and space. When's the best time to ask a million questions? This is executive functioning again, but a lot of parents uh, have things in their mind while they're in the car. Their child doesn't, of course, but they want their child to remember to do this and do this and do this when they get home. The parent feels relieved because it's been said, and then everyone gets home and the child has no memory of what was discussed, right? So I'm no longer answering your question, Yael. I'm answering a different question, but it's like, what does the parent need? And, and being able to be, being able to perceive, is this my need as the parent? Or is this my child's need? We haven't talked about it. I think we could donate another night to this, but you know, whose need is this? So parents wanna know that the day was great and, and we think we're gonna be satisfied by asking an open-ended question and being relieved of our anxiety. And for kids with language disabilities, that can be very difficult to answer and it can be very emotional and loaded because the kids know what you really wanna know. And maybe it didn't happen that day. So how are there other ways to connect? and uh, find out how the day went. If a parent is anxious, can you email a teacher and just say, how did my child do on X, Y, or Z? And then you have that background knowledge. Can there be other ways that you and your child connect on, on activities that you both love as a family? So I know that just opened up a whole nother, you know. No, but you totally hit the nail on the head for me. And this was someone else's question, but I do that to my kids on the way home. How was school? How was this? And how was it? And they're like, ah, stop. <laughs> Yeah, because then we make the kids, and I'm not saying anyone here, of course, but we make the kids look like they have attentional difficulties, you know, because we have these unrealistic expectations that they're going to hold on to something we've said in the car when we get home, and that's no longer the same context. I'm, I'm as I've mentioned, I'm older, and so I'm now getting, you know, clients and colleagues who are texting me, you know, I'm holding up my iWatch, and I'm finding that when I get to another office, I've forgotten what I got in the text. You know what I mean? It's like I have to learn that skill to hold on to a text because when I get to the next office, I'm looking at my emails, right? In the old days, we had phone messages. Who has those anymore? So we have to kind of teach ourselves a way to remember a new behavior so that for me, texts don't fall off of my uh, frontal lobe, but I'm no longer seeing them. So it's the same thing as parents and children. And pretty soon our children will know much more about technology than we were ever trained to know. So there's this nice kind of relationship we can have with, with kids. And you can ask your kids. And again, it's getting a little late, but you could ask your child, when I want to remind you, when do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear it in the car? Or do you want to hear it when you put your backpack down? You know, you can ask your child, do you want to talk about going on a trip now? Or do you want to talk about going on a trip at dinner? Or do you want to talk about it at dinner or at bedtime? A lot of kids who have anxiety don't really want to talk about that at bedtime. But, you know, you get the idea. You're giving the child choice. We're going to talk about it, but when is it best for you? And when we start to do that as we would a spouse or a colleague, then we're showing a tremendous amount of respect. It's not just a demand. Do it. Do it this way. Do it my way. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not talking to any one of you here.
I love that though. That that's true. I like that the the respect, and it is getting really late. I'd love to end with one last question. I'll do my best. Which is, you know, I think one thing that that comes up a lot with kids with slow processing speed or with any other number of learning differences is extended time, more time. And I'd love to hear if what are alternatives or why why should you ask for it, for it? What what are alternatives? Because we know so many two E kids don't want extended time, or they don't use it, um, or they won't use that kind of accommodation. So, are there other things that they should be asking for instead, or should we, is there language we can use to help them understand that extended time is, whether it's on a test or extended deadlines or whatever? I mean, we, we just heard from 2E kids that all it does is make work pile up, or they don't feel um, like it's okay. fair if they get more time on a test than someone else, so. Okay, I'm going to unpack that because there are a couple of different answers to that sem seemingly simple question. The first thing I want to say is that I always want to make sure that uh, when I write up a student's plan that the maximum number of minutes allowable is on there. So if it's 50% or 100%, I just want to make sure that that student has it. They may not need it, but they know they have it if they do need it. Okay, that's the first thing. So from, from that perspective, I want to make sure that students are eligible for what they are eligible for. Now, the next aspect is how the students think about extended time. So it's going to be different from student to student. Some students who are, have superior language skills may believe, and again, we're talking about accurate perceptions again, but some students may think that they're unfair because not everyone has access to them. If that's the case, then they may reject extended time on that basis. So we have to think about what makes sense for that student. Now, a lot of the work that I do, whether it's in clinical practice or at Bridges Academy, we provide differentiation. Differentiation is that students get what they need in the moment they need it. And what's it based on? It's based on the respectful relationship between the teacher and the student. So if the teacher says, I'd like you to take time to do this now, even though others are doing something else, the student trusts the teacher enough to do it because it's a differentiation. We reach the same end goal, whether it's a differentiation or an accommodation, but the delivery is really important. So why would a student accept something they don't perceive as being helpful, perceive as making them different from others or less than or unfair? So we have to address each of these ways of thinking based on the individual student. And I wouldn't blame a student for not wanting to do something that separates them from their peer group. or does something that even the student may perceive the, the teacher has a negative perception about, right? Like we don't even know if the teachers are supportive of the um, accommodation. So again, everything is relationship. I think we can end the evening on that and answer every question that way. It's all about relationship. And um, a student will be willing to do something based on how they want to be seen by others. So the question isn't about, you need this, you must have it, you know, take it. <laughs> it's more about, how do you want to be seen? Do you want to be seen as someone who knows this information? And if so, do you need more time to show that? It's, you know, I'm talking about apples and oranges, aren't I? I'm kind of waxing poetic. Um, in, the, in the daily life, we have to look at all of these situations on an individual basis. And again, couch all of what we're talking about in context for that individual student because what might work for one student won't work for another. I'm a, um, a proponent of extended time. If there are high school students or middle school students that are feeling that it's just there's a never-ending due date, then again we're focusing on product and not as much on process. So intervention can take place and by intervention I just mean a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. What might that high school student need? what would be helpful and provide that student with the words to self-advocate so that more items are taken off their plate than remaining on just because the due date was extended. So we're teaching life skills. As adults, what would we do if we felt too overwhelmed with too many things at once? We would take something off our plate. Kids don't have that option in school. So it's all about problem solving based on strong relationships that are respectful. So good luck to all of you. <laughs> Thank you for ending on that note. I think it's so important. And I really appreciate you sticking around longer 
um, to get some of those those questions in and um, appreciate everyone who stuck here till the end. We had 40 people who stayed until the very bitter end here, or the happy end, as it may be. Um, so thank you all so much for participating and asking such great questions and being a part of this night and talking about this really important topic. There were, Marcy, just so you know, because I know you couldn't see the chat all along, there were a lot of very, this is helpful, thank you so much, um, this was so informative, so. I'm really pleased. That was my hope. I really hoped so, because the world just feels like so much is out of control and processing speed can make us feel that much more so. So I'm hoping that this was helpful and, you know, take each day as it comes. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good night.